All right, are there any questions? All right, so last time we discussed transcription, all right? Today we are going to move on to translation. Yeah, is there a question or no? So in uh, translation, all right, the sequence of nucleotides in a messenger RNA molecule have to be decoded to produce the appropriate proteins. And the code that is used by nature for this purpose is called the genetic code. And this is the map from the nucleotide-based language of RNA to the amino acid-based language of protein. The genetic code was completely worked out in the early 1960s, right? Now, since there are only four different RNA bases, right? A, G, C, and U, and there are 20 amino acids that occur in nature, it is clear that at a minimum, the code has to be a triplet code, right? For those of you that are in communication, you know, if you have just two digits, you cannot, you can represent at most 16, all right, amino acids, all right? So you need a triplet code. Now, the, and of course, it could be a code having more letters than that too, okay? But people check that out, that the three letters actually code for an amino acid and biologists have done experiments in the 60s where basically they will shift it, okay, by one unit, the protein amino acid will change. Then when they shift it by three units and then they translate, right, they get the same set of amino acids, okay? So that means it is a triplet code. People worked all these things out in the 1960s. Now the sequence of nucleotides in the messenger RNA molecule is read consecutively in groups of three, right? Each such group or each such triplet specifying either the start of a protein, the end of a protein, or an amino acid, right? And each nucleotide triplet is called a codon. Now there are 20 possible amino acids as we have been saying all along, and there are 64 possible codons, all right? Because it's a triplet code. Now the codons UAA, UAG, UGA, these three are stop codons, and they signify the end of translation. The codon AUG specifies the amino acid methionine. It's one out of those 20 amino acids, and also indicates the start of a protein, right? So this is the start signal. These, are, these three are the end signals. All the other codons, they code for some amino acid, right? So out of, you know, 64 codons, three have been used up for the stop, right? One for the start, and this also codes for an amino acid, right? That means there are a lot of codons that are left over for covering the 20 amino acids, right? So you're going to have a degenerate code. It's not going to be a one-to-one. -one. Yes, sir, go ahead. Yeah, it's this codon that will signify the start of a protein. Yeah, I mean, like, um, well, I mean, it, it will it'll be a little bit different, okay? But, uh, you know... Uh, the amino acid that is used to start the protein will be the same amino acid, but it will probably have a form, uh, formal group on it. Okay, it will be a little bit different. In fact, that is going to be removed. Like, all amino acids will start with methionine, okay? But the initial starting one, once the protein has been synthesized, that will be taken out. Now, since there are 20 different amino acids and there are 61 codons that code for amino acids, there must be multiple codons that code for the same amino acid. Yes, sir. yes, ma'am. Uh, no, three. three and, and the one no, yeah, but the start also codes for an amino acid. That AUG also codes for an amino acid. So, in other words, so because of this, there are 20 different amino acids, 61 codons coding for amino acids. The genetic code is degenerate, right? And the genetic code is also universal in the sense that all known life on this planet from the simplest bacterium to humans, right, makes use of the same genetic code. Now, we haven't included this entire genetic code since it's not crucial for our purposes, but if you're interested, go and look up any book on molecular biology. They will give you all those 61 letters, all right, 61 different triplet codes, which amino acid corresponds to them, okay? And if you want to, you can go and memorize that also if you, if you like it. You know, so, like you're not getting any homework and all that, you know, so looking for more work, you can do that. Yeah, UAA, but, yeah. But you, you don't need to remember, you're not going to be asked to translate something, right? I mean, we're not asking you to, you know, do, be the translator, okay? Now, since each triplet of nucleotides codes for an amino acid, an RNA sequence can be translated in any one of three reading frames, depending on where you start the decoding, right? Now, the choice of the reading frame is important because if you, change it even by one unit, you have messed up everything, all right? So we are going to see later how a punctuation signal at the beginning of each message 
will set the correct reading frame. Okay. Now the triplets in an mRNA or a messenger RNA molecule, they specify the sequence of amino acids that have to be linked together to produce that particular protein. To actually produce the protein, you need some kind of a decoder or ad adapter molecule, right? And the tRNAs or the transfer RNAs that we talked about earlier, they serve as the adapter molecules that can recognize and bind both to the codon and the messenger RNA. Yes, yeah, go ahead. Uh, in, introns, uh... in introns have been taken out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In introns, you have like also uh, codons? Mm -mm. No. The no, no, you know, in, in, me in messenger RNA, you have introns and you also have exons. Yeah. Okay. And the, 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 uh, the triplets that you can find, they are like associated to one protein or are they No, then they don't code for anything. They don't code for e anything. Introns don't code for anything. Yeah. So they are taken out before the messenger are in eukaryotic. No, no, that, that I know, but uh, the thing is. They don't code for anything. No. They are non coding, uh, non coding regions. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? So tRNA serve as the adapter molecules which can recognize and bind both to the codon on the messenger RNA and at another site on their surface to the amino acid. Okay, because looking, basically looking at this, uh, at these codons, all right, you have to pick up the correct amino acids and link them together to produce the protein, right? Now, what does the tRNA molecule look like? Well, a tRNA molecule or a transfer RNA molecule consists of a chain of about 80 ribonucleotides. So this is a typical tRNA molecule, all right? So parts of it, there's hydrogen bonding because you have A, G, C, and U, okay? So parts of it they will link together and it takes a shape like this, all right? So th there are different regions that have different shapes, but the important thing for our purposes is that there is a region here that is called the anti-codon, all right? That is the complement of the codon, okay? So if there's going to be an AUG, right? This is going to be the complement of that, okay? And obviously, if AUG, the, the complement of that is going to be, the complement of A will be U, all right? Of UA is going to be A, and G is going to be C, all right? So that one is going to bind to the correct amino acid, that is methionine, okay? So this is a tRNA. Based on this codon, right, there has to be the correct amino acid attached here. Then it's going to be a charged tRNA, okay? And this can be used as the adapter molecule to drive protein synthesis. And, and we'll see the mechanism in a few minutes. All right, any questions so far? And the bond here between the amino acid and this 3' end is going to be a high energy bond because remember, protein synthesis is an energetically unfavorable reaction. So you have to, you know, enable it by breaking down some high energy bond, right? So that's how the thing, thing works. So parts of this tRNA chain assume particular shapes by complementary base pairing as shown in the figure. However, two regions of unpaired nucleotides are crucial to the functioning of tRNA in protein synthesis. The first one is the anticodon, which is a set of three consecutive nucleotides that pairs with a complementary codon in an mRNA molecule, right? And the second one is a short single-stranded region at the three prime end of the molecule, that is towards the top, right? Which is the site where the amino acid that matches the codon is attached to the tRNA. Now, the degeneracy of the genetic code implies that either there is more than one tRNA for many of these amino acids, or that some tRNA molecules can base pair with more than one codon, right? In fact, both situations occur. There are amino acids that have more than one tRNA, and some tRNAs are constructed so that they require accurate base pairing only at the first two positions, right? Each, each codon is like three, three letters, okay? Only first two, if they match, there is good, good base pairing, all right? of the codon and they can tolerate a mismatch or what is called a wobble at the third position. This wobble base pairing explains why many of the alternative codons for an amino acid differ only in their third nucleotide. For example, these codons CCA, CCC, CCG, and CCU, all of them code for the amino acid proline. All right, one, again, it's one out of the 20 amino acids. So you need a match only, only in the first two locations. The last one can be anything, A, G, C, U, it doesn't matter, you know, okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, they are not complementary. Yes. Yeah. So at the third place, okay, 
It doesn't have to match because you can, any one of these will work, okay? CCA, CCC, CCG, and CCU, any of these will work, okay? Because only at the, fir the first two locations are determining which amino acid it is, yeah. Yes, sir. No, uh, probably not. Probably not. You know, I'd have to look and see. Tell you. you know. No. Yeah. Huh? I mean, it, 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 Sometimes it could be different. You know, it, it didn't say that. What? Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. We have to cover cover twenty. Yeah. Right. So yeah, it cannot be that in every case you're just having you know that these guys are. All these four are representing the same amino acid. So there will be cases where the third location also will be important. All right, any other questions? Now, there are specific enzymes which are called amino acid tRNA synthetases, which covalently couple each amino acid to its appropriate set of tRNA molecules. Because if, depending on the anticodon in the tRNA, you should have the correct amino acid that is linked to it. And there are enzymes that will that will do that. Right? So specific nucleotides in both the anticodon and the amino acid accepting arm allow the correct tRNA to be recognized by the synthetase enzyme. And this synthetase catalyzed reaction that uh, attaches the amino acid to the three prime end of the tRNA is powered by ATP hydrolysis. Again, you are going to create a high energy bond over there that you will break later on to drive protein synthesis. So that energy has to come from somewhere. It's going to be coming from the hydrolysis of ATP. So this produces a high energy bond between the tRNA and the amino acid. And the energy of this bond is used at a later stage in protein synthesis to covalently link the amino acid to the growing polypeptide chain. So next we move on to the description of the protein synthesis machi machinery. The RNA mes message is decoded on some machinery that are, that, is, that are called ribosomes, right? These are large molecular machines that facilitate accurate and rapid translation of mRNA into protein. The ribosome is going to travel along the mRNA chain, capturing complementary tRNA molecules, holding them in position and bonding them together and bonding together the amino acids that they carry so as to form a protein chain. Because every three letters, okay, every triplet over there is coding for some amino acid. So the ribosome is going to make sure that you're reading the messenger RNA molecule in, in triplets, right? And then the correct amino acid is getting linked onto the previous chain and you, you get, a, get a complete protein. So what is the structure of a ribosome or what is the ribosome made of? A ribosome is made from more than 50 different proteins, which are called the ribosomal proteins and several RNA molecules that are called ribosomal RNAs. Remember, we said there were three different kinds of RNAs. Messenger RNA, ribosomal RNA, and transfer RNA, right? Each of them have roles in the cell. The messenger RNA is the one that is going to produce protein, right? That does the coding. Ribosomal RNA and transfer RNA, they produce some structures that are, that are needed in the protein synthesis machinery and also for, you know, acting as a decoder. Now, a typical living cell contains millions of ribosomes in its cytoplasm. Now, in a eukaryotic cell, again, a eukaryotic cell is a cell which has a nucleus and other organelles. The ribosomal subunits are made in the nucleus by the association of newly transcribed ribosomal RNAs with ribosomal proteins. Now, protein synthesis always takes place out in the cytoplasm. All right? Transcription takes place inside the nucleus for eukaryotic cells. All right? So the, these newly transcribed RNAs are, uh, and, and this ribosomal proteins, they're synthesized in the cytoplasm, so they'll have to be brought inside the nucleus for assembly of the ribosomal units. The individual ribosomal units are then exported. So there's a small ribosomal unit, a large ribosomal unit. They're exported to the cytoplasm to take part in protein synthesis. So a ribosome is made up of two units, a small one and a large one, which fit together to form a complete ribosome and it, it's a pretty big, uh, you know, molecular object because it has got a mass of several million Daltons or several million atomic mass units. The structure of a typical ribosome is shown in the, in the figure on the next slide. All right, so this is a typical ribosome. The thing in the, at the bottom, that is a small ribosomal unit. The thing on the top, that's the large ribosomal unit. All right, the small ribosomal unit, it has the mRNA binding site. All right. 
So you have the messenger RNA, it's going to pass through this and every triplet is coding for some amino acid. This large ribosomal unit, it has got three locations, okay, all right? Uh, it's got an A site, a P site, and an E site, all right? At each, and the size of each of these sites is such that a tRNA molecule can fit in here. One tRNA molecule will fit at the A site, the next tRNA molecule at this site, and, and so on, okay? So the small subunit, the role of the small subunit is to match the tRNAs to the codons of the messenger RNA, while the large subunit will catalyze the formation of the peptide bonds, which will link the amino acids together into a polypeptide chain or a protein. The two subunits are going to come together on a messenger RNA molecule, usually near its beginning, right? Because that's where the translation is going to start, right? And in the case of eukaryotes, right, is the five prime end. Uh, usually it's identified if it's a eukaryote. How are you going to identify the five prime end? Of, of messenger RNA. Anybody? And go ahead. What sequence? No, no, no. A, that's at the end. Huh, what? G. Yeah, methyl G cap. Yeah, yeah. So keep reading the notes because you'll have to take a test soon. Okay. So just keep reading that. <laughs> it's not rocket science, but you have to know what's going on. Yeah. So, now a ribosome contains four binding sites for RNA molecules. All right? One is for the messenger RNA that's in the small ribosomal unit, and there are three other sites called the A site, the P site, and the E site. Maybe the A is the active site and E might be the exit site. You know? That might be the reason why you have these letters. All right? These are for transfer RNAs. Now, a tRNA molecule is held tightly at the A and P sites, only if its anti-codon forms base pairs, allowing for wobble, right? There can be a mismatch in the third location, right? That's the wobble, with a complementary codon on the messenger RNA molecule that is bound to the ribosome, right? So if you have the, if you have the A and P, P sites here, okay? A particular tRNA is going to come and bind here, it's going to stay here, only if its anti-codon matches the codon that is there in, in, the, in this small ribosomal unit in this location. Same way for the next site, P also, if, if there is a tRNA going to be there, then its anti-codon has to match the codon in this region. Right. And the A and P sites are sufficiently close together that the two tRNA molecules that they are carrying are forced to form base pairs with adjacent codons on the mRNA molecule. Codon again is a triplet, okay? So the, these will be forced to form base pairs with adjacent triplets. Okay. So having introduced transfer RNAs and also ribosomes, all right, we've talked about the small ribosomal unit and the large ribosomal unit, we are now in a position to take a detailed look at the steps involved in protein synthesis, all right? So there are two things here, right? Or actually there are three things. How does the pro protein synthesis start? How does it end, okay? And in between it is basically, how do you elongate a protein chain, okay, by one at a time, right? So let's say we have started the protein synthesis, now we just want to elongate. That's what we'll focus on first. So let's first focus on examining the mechanism by which the ribosome adds a new amino acid to a growing polypeptide chain. And the three steps involved are shown in the figure. And I'll try to explain the figure and this is all the text that goes with it, okay? So first you look at the lab, uh, first you look at the figure at the top, right? So this is the small ribosomal unit at the bottom. And then this is the large ribosomal unit. You have the A site, the P site, and the E site, okay? So here you have a growing polypeptide chain. This is the amino terminus of the growing polypeptide chain. Amino acid number one, two, and three have already been attached, okay? Now you, you, you want to basically attach amino acid number four. So, the, so, le, so you, you're starting with this situation. Three is bound to the P region, the anticodon in the P region. And then the next uh, transfer RNA is going to come and bind here where this anticodon is going to match whatever, whatever codon is in there, okay? It's pairing with this. So what happens in step number two? Step number two, the bottom, all right, or the small ribosomal unit moves relative to the large ribosomal unit to the left, okay? And it basically pushes these guys, okay? This fellow is pushed to E, that guy is pushed to the P side, right? A has become empty, right? So this is step number two, right? And this is five prime to three prime. The blue one here is, is basically the messenger RNA. And the different codons are shown using different colors. 
So this is step number two. In step number three, what is going to happen is that the, Sorry, in, in step number two, also what is happening is that this thing has been broken, right? This bond has been broken. While it's moving here, it got, it got connected to four, right? You see that, right? And that's where you're going to need that high energy bond, right? Because this thing, these tRNAs are carrying their amino acids, right? So they're linked by high energy bonds. That has been broken, right? And that the energy from that high energy bond has been used to link up three and four, right? Now, the th so the role of this tRNA, that is number three, is over, right? So in the next step, this thing, this bottom portion will slide back, right? By one codon, it will slide back. And in the process, this guy will get kicked out, right? Number three is, is going to be kicked out, right? And then you're ready for the next one, right? Because see, it's exactly like here. Like here, if you forget about number four, right? You forget about number four, four that is uh, bind, binding the A site, right? Then you have a situation where you have a growing chain. The P site is occupied. That's exactly what you're going to have here. Okay, in step number three, right? So let's just go to go and and then the cycle can repeat, right? The next amino acid number five can come and bind here. Same set of steps are going to be repeated. So that's described in the text here, you know. So the first step, the polypeptide chain containing the amino acids one, two, and three, has just been synthesized. And the transfer RNA corresponding to amino acid 3 is still attached to the amino acid 3 while being located in the P site of the ribosome. That's what you have here. The codon for amino acid 4 being located on the mRNA in the A site of the ribosome. The corresponding transfer RNA with its bound amino acid comes and occupies the A site of the ribosome. Right? In the second step, the small ribosomal subunit with the bound messenger RNA, it moves relative to the large ribosomal subunit in such a way that the tRNAs 3 and 4 get shift, shifted to the E and P sites respectively on the ribosome. Simultaneously, amino acid number 3 detaches from its tRNA and it, it gets linked up to amino acid number 4, right? Still attached to its tRNA. In the next step, this fellow is kicked out and this, this thing moves back, right? And you're ready to repeat the cycle. So in the third step, the tRNA for amino acid 3 is expelled from the E site of the ribosome. And the small ribosomal subunit moves relative to the large ribosomal subunit so that they line up as before, right? And this sets the stage for the tRNA corresponding to amino acid number five to get into the A site of the ribosome so that we are essentially back to step one. But now we have a polypeptide chain that is one unit longer, right? And the process continues. All right, any questions so far? So now we have to see how do you start a polypeptide chain and how do you end a polypeptide chain, okay? So in between we know if you're having a chain that's being produced, it's going to increase in length by one at a time by following this, this kind of process. Now the central reaction of protein synthesis in which an amino acid that is bound to its tRNA is detached from the tRNA and linked to the growing polypeptide chain is cataly catalyzed by what is called peptidyl transferase enzyme activity which is part of the ribosome, right? The, the large ribosomal unit takes care of this. The catalytic part of the ribosome in this case is thought to be not one of the proteins, but rather one of the ribosomal RNAs in the large ribosomal subunit. So the ribosomal RNA in this case is playing a catalytic function. It's not just a storage of information. So the next thing that we have to see is how protein, protein synthesis starts and how it ends, okay? And these, again, it's a little bit different between prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells. Now, codons in the messenger RNA signal where to start and where to stop protein synthesis, all right? Because we know there is a start co codon is AUG, all right, and stop codons UAA and, and so on, all right? So the translation of a messenger RNA begins with the codon AUG, and a special tRNA is required to initiate translation. AUG also codes for the amino acid methionine. Now, the initiated tRNA always carries the amino acid methionine, and in the case of bacteria, there is a modified form of methionine, which is formal methionine, all right? Remember, we talked about formic acid, HCOOH, okay? Formaldehyde and so on. So, you know, if you, if you put that formic group, all right, on methionine, you'll get formal methionine, all right? It's used so that newly made proteins will always have methionine as the first amino acid at that amino terminal end. And this methionine is, is usually removed later by a specific protease. Again, a protease is basically an enzyme that 
disintegrates proteins. Okay, they'll chew up proteins, right? Break, break the peptide bonds and, you know, produce the constituent amino acids. The initiator tRNA is distinct from the tRNA that normally carries methionine. Okay, it's a little bit different, and it has the capability to bind the small ribosomal unit, as I will show in the next picture. So, so let's talk about eukaryotes, that is cells with nucleus. In eukaryotes, the initiated tRNA, which is coupled to methionine, okay, this is the tRNA that is going to get the protein synthesis reaction going, is first loaded into, into the small ribosomal subunit, along with additional proteins which are called initiation factors. Of all the charged tRNAs in the cell, only the charge initiator tRNA is capable of tightly binding the small ribosomal subunit, as shown in the figure on the, on the next slide, right? So this is the situation, okay? So this is the initiator tRNA, it is bound to methionine, okay? This is the one that can start, get the process of uh, translation started. So it will bind to the P, P site, see this is A, P and E, right? So it will bind to, the, to, to wherever the P should be going on the small ribosomal unit. And then it will identify by the 5' prime cap, if it is a eukaryotic cell, it identifies the beginning of the messenger RNA molecule, right? 5' prime cap here, poly A tail here. So it, it is going to bind like this. And this is the only one, right, which has the capability of binding this small ribosomal unit. And then it goes searching, right, along this messenger RNA molecule looking for the first AUG, right? That's the start codon. So once it finds the first AUG, right, it's come here, what happens is all those additional factors that it had, they will dissociate from this initiated tRNA, right? And it will make room for the large ribosomal unit to assemble on top of it, right? So if you look at the next page, right? So it found the AUG, it got rid of all those you know, initiation factors, right, they're gone, and the large ribosomal unit has formed on it, okay. This is exactly the situation, right, when we were looking at the elongation of the protein chain, okay, only difference is that here we had some other stuff attached, but if, because here it's starting from scratch, you just have the methionine on the initiator TRNA, uh, TRNA, right. And from now onwards, exactly the same procedure can continue, right? like whichever amino acid, you know, whose... Um, uh, the, the, the tRNA corresponding to the amino acid whose, uh, I'm sorry, the tRNA whose anti-codon matches the codon here, right? It'll come along with that amino acid coming here in, in the A site. Then again, it's the same story. This will move to the left, right? Then again, I mean, that bond will be for, uh, formed. It's been formed. And then in the next step, this guy is kicked out. This thing comes back, and the, then the th process continues. So of all the charged tRNAs in the cell, only the charged initiated tRNA is capable of tightly binding the small ribosomal subunit, as I showed you in the figure. The loaded ribosomal subunit binds to the 5' prime end of an mRNA molecule, which is recognized in part by the methyl G cap present in eukaryotic mRNA. The small ribosomal subunit will then move along the mRNA, searching for the first AUG, right? When this AUG is encountered, several initiation factors dissociate from the small ribosomal subunit, to make way for the large ribosomal subunit to assemble and complete the ribosome. Right, and this is explained in all these pictures, right, and, uh, and then you, the protein synthesis steps are exactly the same as before. The el elongation steps will continue. Now, once the ribosome assembly is completed, the next tRNA with attached amino acid can bind the codon in the A site and protein synthesis can continue as described earlier. Right. And the mechanism for selecting a start codon in bacteria is a little bit different, right? It doesn't go looking just for AUG. Bacterial mRNA have got no 5' prime methyl G caps to tell the ribosome where to begin searching for the start of translation. Instead, they contain specific ribosome binding sequences up to six nucleotides long that are located a few nucleotides upstream of the AUGs at which translation is to begin, right? So unlike a eukaryotic ribosome, a prokaryotic ribosome can readily bind directly to a start codon that lies in the interior of a messenger RNA, as long as the ribosome binding site precedes by several nucleotides. So if you're looking at a prokaryotic RNA, there can be a lot of locations, right, where the ribosome can bind, right? 
So you could have several proteins being translated from the same messenger RNA in the case of prokaryotic cells. In eukaryotic cells, it's one messenger RNA is for one protein because it'll go looking for the five prime metal G clamp, right? Here it's different. So consequently, prokaryotic mRNAs are what is often referred to as polycystronic. That is, they encode several different proteins. In contrast, a eukaryotic mRNA usually carries the information for just one single protein. So we have now looked at the you know, elongation of the protein chain. We have looked at start of translation, right? Next, how does it end? So as I mentioned to you earlier, we have three stop codons, right? So the end of the protein coding message is signaled by one of several codons either UAA, UAG, or UGA, right? And all of these are called stop codons. These are not recognized by a tRNA, right? And do not specify an amino acid, right? But they signal to the ribosome that it's time to stop translation, right? Now, proteins that are known as release factors will bind to any stop codon that reaches the A site on the ribosome. You're not going to have a tRNA anymore. You'll have release factors that will bind to that uh, stop codon. And this is going to alter the activity of that enzyme. So this binding alters the activity of the peptidyl transferase in the ribosome, causing it to catalyze the addition of a water molecule instead of an amino acid to the pept peptidyl tRNA. Right? This reaction frees the carboxyl end of the growing polypeptide chain. And since only this attachment normally holds the growing polypeptide to the ribosome, the completed protein chain is immediately released into the cytoplasm. So that's the end of protein synthesis. So even before a ribosome has finished translating a messenger RNA, other ribosomes can get on the R messenger RNA at more uh, upstream locations and initiate translation. Like you don't have to wait for the entire protein to be synthesized, okay? As the ribosome is moving along the messenger RNA, right? Some part, has, uh, of the ribosome, uh, some part of the messenger RNA is now available for another ribosome to bind and start producing an another uh, protein. You know, same kind of protein molecule, but, uh, you know, so, so this can, can actually speed up things. You know? And in fact, these ribosomes, you can see under a microscope, right? I mean, you, you will see one, the one that has moved furthest down, it has got the longest protein, right? Next one, a little bit shorter and so on, you know? So multiple ribosomes uh, <coughs> getting onto the messenger RNA and translating stuff into protein. So thus, several ribosomes could be simultaneously working on the same mRNA molecule, forming what are called polyribosomes. And this is stuff that people can see under a, under a microscope. Now, the amount of protein in each cell is regulated by carefully controlled protein breakdown. Proteins vary enormously in their lifespan. Some proteins may last for months or even years. Others last for days, hours, or even seconds. So a natural question that arises is, how does the cell control these lifetimes? Cells have got specialized pathways that enzymatically break down proteins into their constituent amino acids, a process that is termed proteolysis. Enzymes that degrade proteins, that chew up proteins, they are known collectively as proteases. We already talked about that before. Right? Proteases, nucleases, and so on. Yeah. Now, one function of proteolytic pathways is to rapidly degrade those proteins whose lifetimes must be short. Another is to recognize and eliminate proteins that are damaged or misfolded. Right? Because you don't want defective proteins. Now, most proteins that are degraded in the cytosol of eukaryotic cells are broken down by large complexes of proteolytic enzymes that are called proteasomes. So it's like a big trash kit cleaner, you know, that is going to recycle stuff, right? So the proteins that are imported into proteasomes for degradation have usually been marked out for destruction by the covalent attachment of a small protein called ubiquitin, right? So when a protein is, is marked with that other protein, that means it's trash. It's like us, you know, taking stuff out of the office and writing trash and, you know, uh, setting it up for, for, for disposal. The same thing happens in the case of proteins. Now, in all of life that we see around us today, DNA, RNA, pro and proteins have very specialized individual roles. Right? DNA, it is the carrier of genetic information. Okay? It is the storehouse. Its role is basically to you know, faithfully store the information. Right? For proteins, it is basically to catalyze reactions. Right? Proteins are highly effective catalysts. Right? And for RNA, it is something intermediate. RNA is serving as the inter intermediate right? from DNA to RNA and then to protein. Right? So it is speculated that life initially originated in an RNA world. There were no proteins, there was no DNA. Right? Since RNA is capable of both information storage in the sequence of its nucleotides, as well as carrying out catalytic functions, this is a very plausible conjecture. 
and it is thought that the initial RNA formed during the violent conditions present on the ancient earth. All right. So scientists have done experiments where, you know, they try to simulate the conditions on the earth, you know, thousands of millions of years ago, there'll be methane gas, no oxygen and all that stuff. And then, you know, if you have lightning, thunder, lightning and all that, so they'll put some arcs, all right? Artificially electric arcing and all that, and they've been able to produce these RNA molecules, all right? So they think that's how life originated. So in the beginning, it's an RNA world, all right? And then with time, uh, the, the specialists emerge, all right? Like for the DNA became the uh, the molecule for storing information, and proteins emerge as the molecules for catalyzing reactions, okay? So in the beginning, it's like, you know, in, in, this, in this world, in the beginning, you have only uh, family practitioners, all right? General doctors, and then all specialists have emerged, okay? Cardiologists, oncologists, and so on, okay? So later on, DNA and proteins took over some tasks from the RNA since DNA was better suited for information storage, and proteins could perform a whole variety of other functions, including serving as catalysts, resulting in the state of affairs we see today. Right. And this may also explain, remember, there were some molecules that we saw. For example, ATP, right? ATP, then we looked at uh, acetyl coenzyme A, right? Then NADPH, right? Remember the nicotine adenine, nicotine amide adenine dinucleotide stuff, you know, the, the ca uh, carriers of high energy electrons, right? All of them had nucleotides in them, okay? Maybe because life originated in an RNA world, so they have the nucleotide embedded in them, you know, because, but the nucleotide really doesn't have any function uh, at the current time, other than ATP, right, which is used in nucleotides, which is used in DNA RNA synthesis. The others don't have any, fu any function, you know, so, but still they will have nucleotides in them. So this may be a consequence of life having originated in an RNA world, right? Again, this is just a conjecture, and nobody knows anything for sure. All right, any questions? So when you started this course, you didn't have any idea about molecular biology, organic chemistry, or whatever. Or at least that's what I like to believe. Okay, now you at least know how the information is stored in DNA, or you learned about carbohydrates, lipids, and all that stuff. Information stored in DNA, or right, how that is is then transcribed into RNA, all right, mess, uh, messenger RNA, and then it is translated into protein. Okay. So you know, and and that is crucial. Like, you know, if uh, uh, protein synthesis or Transcription in your body stops, you will be dead. Okay, because sometimes there is snake bite, right? Right, a snake bites you, you know, so it injects its venom. Those are things that actually go and uh, you know stop RNA synthesis. Okay, uh, RNA, so it's going to kill you molecule by molecule. All right, so 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 so, so that's the reason it's going to stop the uh, you know the different processes in your body. Okay, and then, uh, for example, I mean, all of you are probably familiar that you know. Potassium cyanide, right, is a, is a deadly poison, okay. Have you heard of that or no? How come, you know, I heard about it when I was in high school, you know. Like the chemistry professor used to say, you know, the guy that took it before he could say what the taste was, he died, okay. And the reason he'll die is because you're killed at the molecular level, okay. What, what that is going to do, right, potassium cyanide is going to react with the acid in your stomach, right. And it's, it's going to produce hydrogen cyanide, okay. That is going to go and interfere in your mitochondria, right? You have oxidative phosphorylation. You have a process for generating ATPs, all right? It, it needs oxygen. It's going to go and block that, okay? And guess once, once, that block, once that block takes place, all right? You might be the, you know, biggest guy on this planet, right? You're going to die cell by cell, okay? Because uh, you cannot do those activities anymore, all right? So this is, uh, you know, uh, really important because at the molecular level, you know, the activities are crucial. I mean, we don't see that all the time. You know, you don't worry if you're studying for an exam, you don't worry whether your mitochondria and all that is working fine or not, okay? <laughs> if it's not, you'll be dead, okay? But I'm saying it is that crucial, all right? Uh, so, uh, so yeah, snake venom is, like if it's a poisonous snake and all that, you know, it'll cause massive cell death, right? It's going to, uh, you know, trigger apoptosis, right? Go in there, and there are different mechanisms, all right? I mean, um, and these days people are trying, uh, you know, in the center also I heard somebody say that they are trying to make some drugs out of snake venom, you know, for anti-cancer drugs and things like that, you know, because those have specific uh, properties, all right, that will attack at the, at the molecular level. All right, any questions so far? So now we are going to move on to 
uh, the chapter on chromosomes and gene regulation and the motivation for the ch this chapter is the following. If you look at a human being, all right, all the cells in your body other than the reproductive cells, they have exactly the same set of genes, okay? But then how, why do cells that make up hair look so different from your skin, from your bones and so on, okay? The reason is because not every cell is producing every protein, okay? The code is there, okay? But only parts of the code are active in different cells. For example, the beta cells in your pancreas are the only cells in your body that produce insulin, right? The red blood cells in your body are the only cells in the body that produce hemoglobin and so on, okay? So that means just because you have that DNA does not mean that you'll produce that protein all the time. All right? There must be a control mechanism that decides which protein is going to be produced when. Okay. Okay. And uh, you know you can think of this as control of gene expression, all right, or control of transcription. And uh, you know probably the most uh, dramatic example of that is the development of an individual from a single fertilized egg, right? Because you know when a kid is growing in the womb, right, during those nine months, right, in order for, you know, the fingers, you know, head, toe, everything to develop, right, the right genes have to turn on, right, at the right time and at the right place, okay. If they don't, you'll have six fingers, okay, instead of five and, and things like that, okay. So it's all pre-programmed, right, and uh, like if you look at a cow, right, or a bull, right, the horns grow on its head, right, you don't see horns growing in the middle of the mouth, right. But in this code, I'll give you an example that it is possible by going and messing around with gene expression, and biologists have done that. Like, you know, the genes that produce eyes, okay? They can take a, a fruit fly, right, which is a model organism, right? They can take the fruit fly and then go ahead and express the genes that, that grow into the eye, all right, on the feet of that or organism, right, on the legs, right? And then that organism will have eyes growing on the legs, you know? It is possible to do that, right? I mean, although, you know, for fruit flies, I guess it's okay, but humans and all, if you say you're going to produce like a 10 headed monster or something, you know, in this country, they probably won't let you do that, okay, because there are, uh, you know, all kinds of organizations that will come after you, you know. And even for, you know, uh, people that, that do research in the life sciences, especially if it involves animal use, there are committees at the university level, animal use committee and all that, that will look at that. Okay, you cannot say, you know, I'm a sadist, okay, I like to kill animals or something, that's why just for the fun of it, no, they have to see the scientific value, then you have to have a plan for, you know, uh, humanly treating the animals. Because there are people, even on this campus, who study, let's say, for example, colon cancer, okay? And they want to see the effect of diet, right, in mediating colon cancer. So, so per on purpose, they will induce cancer in animals, right? And, uh, you know, these animals, they get colon cancer, so they, they are going to get blood in the stool, right? And, and develop big tumors. So you have to have a plan that, okay, if this animal is suffering too much, right, then you will terminate the animal. You'll e euthanize the, uh, these animals, right? And the protocol has to be followed, right? I mean, sometimes students don't realize that, but if you're a PI on one of those grants, okay, and you said that, okay, if the animal is sick for two days, I'm going to terminate it, you don't do that, right? The whole university can be fine, okay? Because there are f because you said you're going to, I mean, the students often think, ah, it's no big deal, okay? Especially, I mean, if you come from overseas, like many of us, even I came from overseas, yeah, it's no big deal, you know, even if you said, how does it matter? No, you have to follow exactly, right? Because if you violate that, the whole university can be in trouble. Like, they can, you know, uh, freeze the federal grants and things like that, you know. I mean, one time it happened here, I don't know exactly what it was, but I think some, uh, you know, uh, some organism in, in connection with bioterrorism was not being properly stored or something. I think the university probably did get fined or something, or a warning, you know. So uh, the consequences can be pretty serious, you know. It's not like us, even for us it can be serious if we are actually designing a bridge or an airplane, okay. But at the university it's probably okay, right. Right, I mean, we are doing like textbook examples, but if you're actually designing a bridge and that fails because you're not careful, you know, you will get sued and you'll end up in all, all kinds of trouble, you know. So, but in, in, in the bio area, it's a lot worse, right? For researchers over there, they have to be really, really careful. Right? Because, you know, one mistake is one too many, basically, so. Okay, so this chapter will talk about chromosomes and gene regulation. That's about how the DNA in the cells is organized, right? So in this chapter, we study the organization of DNA inside cells and the various factors that play a role in determining whether and to what extent a particular gene is expressed in a cell. Again, remember, a gene being expressed means the corresponding stretch of DNA is getting copied into RNA. Transcription is taking place, right? 
Now, the genome of an organism, is, the genome is the entire set of DNA, right, in the cell of that organism. So the genome of an organism encodes all of the RNA and protein molecules that are needed to make, the, make its cells. However, not every gene needs to be expressed all the time, right? In fact, even the simplest single-cell bacterium can use its genes selectively, switching genes on and off, so that it makes different metabolic enzymes depending on the food sources that are available to it. In fact, there is a very famous... Um, experiment, you know, uh, using what is called the lactose operon, right, where, you know, E. coli, right, this bacterium, right, it, it, like you and me, it likes glucose, right, so it has the enzymes for, for processing glucose, for breaking down glucose, all this glycolysis and all that stuff. Now, if you, if you, if you put lactose, the, the sugar that is there in milk, right, in its environment, there's no glucose, right, it can produce the enzymes that are needed to break down lactose, right. So there is some kind of a control mechanism. See, if glucose is there, it's not producing the enzyme that is needed to uh, process lactose. Right? But if uh, glucose, if, if the environment contains lactose, then it will adapt. You know? So by turning on the right genes right, to produce that enzyme. Right? So that is called the lactose op operon, and that was discovered by two guys by the name of J Jacob and Menard in the 1960s. And they got a Nobel Prize, okay, how that thing turns on and off. Right? That's control of cell uh, control, control of uh, gene expression. Now, in multicellular organisms such as our cells, gene expression is under even more elaborate control because all the different cells that we have have to come from one single cell. Okay, the same genome has to be able to produce all the different cells. Okay, so they contain the same genome, and the differences are caused by the fact that different cell types express different genes right. and produce different proteins. Now, in eukaryotes, the DNA in the nucleus, most of the DNA is in the nucleus. The mitochondria has some DNA, but most of it is in the nucleus. The DNA in the nucleus is distributed among a set of different chromosomes. Right? That's how it's organized. Somebody asked me two, three lectures ago about how the, the DNA is organized inside cells. It's organized in the form of chromosomes. Each chromosome consists of an enormously long DNA molecule, which is folded and compacted by certain proteins. The complex of DNA and protein is called chromatin. Now, in addition to the DNA packaging proteins, chromosomes are also associated with proteins that are involved in DNA replication. Remember, a lot of information is stored. Every time you need to re replicate the DNA, you have to open all of this up, make sure it's copied perfectly, right, and then put back again, right? And the level of compaction is huge. I mean, we might think that we are doing all the CDs and all, the, all that stuff. This is much more than that, you know. In fact, Professor Vaidyanathan, who is a professor at, of signal process, uh, processing at Caltech, he was saying that, you know, this... I don't know what the size is on the CD, okay, but he was saying that this is more than, more than that, you know, so the level of compaction. Right. Now, in the case of prokaryotes or bacteria, the DNA is organized into one circular chromosome. The genome is a lot smaller, and this is carried out by some proteins, but not too much is known about the details. Now, human cells, with the exception of the germ cells, that is the egg and the sperm, each contain two copies of each chromosome, one inherited from the mother and one from the father. And the two copies are called homologous chromosomes. The one inherited from the father is called the paternal homologue, while the one inherited from the mother is called the maternal homologue. The only non-homologous chromosomes or non-matching chromosomes are the sex chromosomes in males, where a Y chromosome is inherited from the father and an X chromosome is inherited from the mother. Uh, females, on the other hand, have homo homologous sex chromosomes since they inherit X chromosomes from both parents. Now, the standard way of distinguishing one chromosome from another is to stain them with dyes that bind to certain types of DNA sequences. So these dyes mainly distinguish between DNA that is rich in AT nucleotide pairs from DNA that is rich in GC nucleotide pairs. Right? So you'll have a pattern along each chromosome, and, and it's usually quite distinct. Right? So this produces a characteristic pattern of bands along each chromosome, and such a pattern is called a karyotype. Right? Since the pattern for each chromosome is unique, these bands can be used to distinguish one chromosome from another. Right? Moreover, they can be used to search for chromosomal abnormalities when, which characterize certain inherited birth defects at the prenatal stage and predispose individuals to certain types of cancers. Right? And they do this. There is a test called amniocentesis. Before a, a kid is born, you know, they take out some amniotic fluid. Right? In that, they will get the cells and they can break up the cells and look at the shape of the chromosomes by labeling these different chromosomes. Right? If these chromosomes look different, then there is trouble, you know, because that kid will prob probably develop abnormalities. Right. Okay, let's uh, stop here for today. Yeah.